So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Minnesota DNR's uh, response to CWD. I'm going to kind of keep it at a higher level. In other words, I'm not going to show a lot of dots on the map of sample, samples we've taken. You can find all that on our website. It's readily available, um, and I really don't want to go down to the details of we collected this many samples here. It gets pretty boring. Um, so as, as Peter said, I oversee our wildlife research unit, uh, which is four groups uh, and a couple of biometricians and some other staff. And we do very applied research related to wildlife issues, including wildlife disease. We actually have a social scientist on staff. Um, uh, and as, as Peter said, I've been dabbling in CWD stuff for about 20 years. And my background is a little different in that um, my undergraduate and master's degree are in straight up wildlife biology, wildlife ecology. I've worked as a wildlife manager for a very long time. But my PhD is in social psychology, dealing with hunter attitudes and behaviors towards regulatory changes. So I have a bit of a blended background with respect to the biological and the social sciences. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we weave the two as we go through this and what, why some of the, you know, why both are really important. So if I can get this, this worked a little bit ago. There we go. So I'm going to talk about CWD in Minnesota. Uh, and again, it's the wildlife research and policy for the DNR. I've, had, uh, I've been here about 17 years. So why do we care? As a state wildlife agency, why do we care about disease? Um, Dr. Larson did a really nice job talking about the different individuals that are uh, uh, where deer are important and how people get various uses or benefits out of deer, whether those are, are consumptive or non-consumptive benefits. And it's important to us as a state wildlife agency, in part because we have a mission to do that. And when I talked a little bit about a biological and a social background, read the DNR mission. You know, work with citizens to protect and manage resources, uh, provide outdoor opportunity, commercial uses, and then create a sustainable quality of life. So the DNR mission is not really about biology. It is a little bit where protecting and managing our natural resources, that's straight up conservation. But within our mission, we talk about outdoor recreation, we talk about commercial uses, and we talk about sustained quality of life. Those are social issues. Um, so it's important that we care as a state agency about this issue or, or any of the other issues we might talk about because that's in our mission. That we, This is what we do as we think about current and future generations as we manage our fish and wildlife species. So that's all flowery, right? That's great. We have a nice mission, and we do. Um, I teach my students uh, in my class in the spring that that mission is often in conflict, and that's a different conversation. But there are competing values in that mission. Um, however, we also have things that are rooted in Minnesota law. It's, it's the law to manage for long-term viability of species. Um, the statutes that are passed down by the Minnesota legislature say that ownership of wildlife is the property of the state. So wild animals are owned by the people of the state. And that 97A.025 actually dates back to the, the turn of the 20th century. I think 1914 is when this law was put into effect. And it's been largely unchanged since then. Um, the commissioner, our commissioner is uh, Sarah Strawman. Uh, she has charge of all, and control of all public lands and wildlife. And that responsibility is passed down to the agency to manage those species. And that, finally, we conserve and enhance through planned scientific management protection and utilization. So the law tells us that we manage wildlife species for current and future generations. So if you hear me on the radio talking about that, I'm basing what I say in Minnesota law. So I just wanted to kind of set it up that way because it's not, um, uh, it's important to us as, as public land ma uh, managers to think about things for current and future generations. And, and this disease is not a current generation issue per se, it's a future generation issue. So one of the complexities with dealing with this disease, and, and, and Dr. Larson mentioned this in her talk, uh, animals are asymptomatic for a number of years, up to two or three. And then when, when they become symptomatic, they, they decline very quickly on the order of months until they finally exhibit clinical disease. If you, if you look at the slide, you know, which of these deer are not CWD positive? Can you tell me? You can't. You can probably this one. This one's clearly a clinical, animal, clinical case. Um, this is the Pine Island uh, deer in 2010. 
Um, the only one in this slide that is not CWD positive is the one that has ear tags in it that say don't and miss. Um, somebody did that in our CWD zone and they were, uh, we were able to get the deer killed. But this is the only one that was not detected for chronic wasting disease. These other animals were hunter harvested during the regular deer season and they came back positive. And if you were to look at them, they look perfectly normal. And that's one of the challenges we have. Um, uh, they don't turn white or black or gray when they get sick. They look just like any other deer you might harvest. So that's one of the challenges we have as that public trust agency to manage for a chronic disease when a, a sick deer largely looks the same as a, as a healthy deer for most of, the, most of the infection period. So our surveillance program, we actually started in 2002, August 2002, there was a positive elk farm in Aiken County, um, and also the disease was found in late 2001, early 2002 in Wisconsin. So that actually put the disease uh, into the Midwest in right, right at the thing it was December 2001. <laughs> so it became really important to, the, to those of us managing Midwest white-tailed deer populations. Up until then, it was a Western disease in Colorado and Wyoming, and we didn't think too much about it. So over the course of from 2002 to 2004, we did a rolling statewide surveillance program. We tested about 28,000 deer and didn't find any positives. And it, after we got done with our statewide surveillance, we made the decision that we had to change our strategy. And the reason, the reason for that was in 2003 and 2004, which were pretty even years for numbers of samples, we, we were spending between 1.2 and 1.4 million dollars in both those years. And that's 2003 and four dollars. So as an agency that relies entirely on license sales to exist, or almost entirely, um, we can't afford that level of surveillance on an annual basis. It's just not in our budgets, simply not in our budget. So in 2005, we started to look at the disease a little bit differently. We look at it as a function of risk. Okay, risk, risk is identified in multiple ways. The symptomatic deer that, that someone might call in, hey, I have, I have a deer that's, that's, that's acting strange, and we, if we can collect it, we'll take the sample. So, so what we would call a deer exhibiting a, a suspect animal, showing clinical signs. Um, a new infection in an adjacent state. Think about Wisconsin over here. Think about Iowa over here. So our risk changes as the disease gets closer and closer to Minnesota. And on multiple occasions, we've, we've, te we've tested along the border um, uh, of Wisconsin and Iowa as a result of their positives. So, and the third form of risk is when, when the disease is found in the captive servant industry, we do surveillance around those, cap those farms because that's also a risk. So, we don't, um, so we're very thoughtful about how we do surveillance because in many respects it's very, very expensive. Um, just kind of one slide on, <coughs> on our surveillance program this year. Um, so what we do is we, we, just finished, we just finished modifying our, our CWD management and response plan and all this stuff is readily available on the DNR website, uh, mndnr.gov slash CWD. Um, as we worked ourselves through how to respond to the disease, we've decided that what we'll do is we'll draw a, 16, a 15 mile circle around a positive deer and that's, that's gonna be our zone. So what we've done this year is since we have positives here, there's a positive right here in Wisconsin on the line, there's a positive down here in Iowa, there's a positive, uh, several positive deer up here in Winona County, um, sorry, down right there, Winona County. So we now have a large CWD management zone in the southeast. We have, we've set up some control zones, that's the yellow, uh, and those are areas that we don't want the d deer moving out of those areas. We're trying to stop the or slow down or stop the spread. So we have certain regulations in, in these yellow areas. Um, and then way up here in the north central part of the state that I, I just kind of blew up because that's our new area. Um, that's our new CWD zone that we're calling 604 um, uh, starting this year. And this just wanted to show kind of the practical nature of drawing zones. I talked about fi a 15 mile circle. If anyone can describe, legally describe a 15 mile circle for me that we can put in a regulations book and enforce a law, I'll buy you lunch. You can't, you can't do it, right? So our zones are always, our zones are never 15 or 10 miles because they have to be enforceable. So what we do is we draw a circle around the positives and then we bound our, we bound our zone by roads. 
So we ended up being a little bit bigger here, slightly smaller here, and that's really just a function of being able to, to, to draw and enforce a zone. So we get criticized about that. Well, it's not exactly 10 miles or not exactly 15 miles, but it has to be logically explained. And within our authorities for rules with CWD management, we, the legislature has given the Department of Natural Resources very broad authority to manage for disease. We have the ability to restrict recreational feeding. We have the ability to make surveillance mandatory. We can restrict carcass movements. Um, we can do all sorts of stuff related to disease response. That is, is unique means it never occurs anywhere else. It's not unique, but it is rare. <clears throat> Most states don't have the authority to simply have a special hunt three weeks after they find a positive deer. Most states can't say, you shall not take a carcass out of this zone until a test result is reported as non-detected. We can do that um, in Minnesota. So when you hear things related to disease responses in Wisconsin or Iowa or Michigan or anywhere else, you have to take a step back and think about what are the authorities of those states and what can they do. Um, uh, in fact, that our legislature has really uh, t has taken this seriously for a very long time, uh, but amped it up this year. Uh, I'll talk about funding in a second, but uh, on the funding side, but also we've been restricting carcasses from out of state for uh, from all states since 2016, from CWD places since 2004. But in 2016, our our agency decided to restrict any any carcass from any state com uh, coming in whole. Um, and this last year, the legislature actually put that in state law. So they took one of our rules and turned it into a law. So that, that's where we work together on, on some of these authorities. Um, Wisconsin does not have similar laws. You can move carcasses around Wisconsin. You can't in Minnesota. So we do lots of stuff related to disease management. Um, check out our website, look in our regs book for more details. But the key here is that we, we do take a very aggressive stance towards the disease and we, we really thoughtfully or, you know, organize our rules and regulations around that, but they have to also be enforceable. So I was watching, some, I was trying to get a flavor for how, how to construct this talk, so I started watching some TED Talks and I stumbled upon one and I hope I didn't break some law, but I am crediting Dr. Tracy McNamara um, who gave a TED Talk about biosecurity and the realities of doing biosecurity surveillance. And I, I screenshot this slide because it encapsulates everything that we do with respect to funding. Um, most of our surveillance is born on the backs of people who buy hunting and fishing licenses. That changed for this, this fiscal year. The legislature appropriated about $1.8 million over two years to help with our surveillance program. But historically, that's been born on the backs of, of people who buy licenses. And when I saw this slide, I mean, this, this makes perfect sense to me. A lot of money goes into human health. A lot of money goes into agricultural uh, surveillance. Very little, uh, very few federal dollars go into wildlife surveillance. And this is one of the realities that we have as, as state wildlife agencies um, with declining hunter numbers and declining revenue bases um, that we still have to do this really important, really expensive work and there's almost no federal money to do it. So I thought this was really compelling that, that you know, we could argue that none of the pies are big enough but we know that the wildlife pie is, is infinitesimally small. So that's kind of the setup. Um, I'll get to the biological piece in a second, but we're doing a lot of social science work related to deer hunters and landowners and the general public. And <coughs> this slide, I'll explain it, but this slide frustrates me and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, because we, we do know that, you know, DNR has the ability to do all sorts of stuff like I talked about. Uh, but if people aren't going to, to partake in those, in those activities, if we design a rule that they don't or don't want to or can't follow, then it doesn't work. The other piece is that we need, if we want to lower deer densities, we just don't wave a magic laser pointer and the deer density goes down. It's, it's a lot of work on the part of hunters. So you're asking hunters to do something that is not in their, their, their immediate self-interest. I'm asking you to lower the deer population, which means that you will be less successful in the short term. So it's a difficult message to spin because we're talking about your kids and grandkids. So what's frustrating about this is we did a survey, and this is a random survey of deer hunters in the southeast. So if you bought a license, we selected a percentage of those people uh, uh, and surveyed them. 
So we ask a basic question, what should the regulations be? Well, everybody, you know, everybody can align with the fact that a regulation should not be, should be designed to impact spread. We, don't want, we want you to do something so the disease doesn't spread, but don't, um, don't impact participation and don't hurt local economies. So, but the problem is we can broadly agree on the, co the, the big concept of what to do with disease. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts of actually implementing a regulation, we have very little support. Most people don't support lowering densities. They don't support um, different regulations. They, they don't support being passive. That's really good. But um, that not, not so much being aggressive. So you, you know, we, all wanna, we all want a puppy, but are we willing to get up three times a night for the next six weeks getting a puppy? Maybe not. And I've said that because I'm doing that now. <laughs> so. Um, so then, you know, then we look at we look at, re at the regulatory piece. So, what specifically, what regulations would you support as a deer hunter in order to affect this de this desire of not um, uh, spreading disease? Well, you know, the easy stuff. We can ban feeding. That's that's highly supported, but there's not a lot of cost to that. You're not giving up a lot of opportunity. Expand the venison donation program. We're looking at doing that, where people can donate deer to to local communities. You know, prohibiting carcasses, that's really good. You know, have a little bit longer season. You know, so the stuff that's fairly easy to do and not that controversial really falls to the right of that graph. The stuff that, that you know, might lead to more deer being killed uh, during the season, not so much. <coughs> so, um, so that's the, the, the quandary that we're in as state wildlife managers, that people want to see this but it's very difficult to get there because they don't support the things that, get, that are over here. Um, now that said, we often do things that the public doesn't agree with. And the best example is right here, professional culling of deer. That's where we use USDA to take deer off of private lands with permission. Which it's very successful for removing positives and lowering local densities. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good strategy for accomplishing our goals. However, the public doesn't support it. So even so, I'm not. What I'm saying is that we don't always go with survey says. We balance our survey results with um, the biological needs that we have in front of us, and we do that at some cost, right? So stepping over to the biological side, um, we're doing a, a, a really nice research project that was that was partially funded by LCCMR, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund looking at deer movements. And what we're trying to, de trying to do is uh, answer some questions is how are these deer using the, the landscape, using the habitat uh, in, the, in, our, in our disease area? So for the last two years, and we have at least one more year, we're collaring white-tailed deer around our, our CWD zone, and we're looking at uh, documenting dispersal. Where are these animals going? And as, as Peter said, I'm having a hard time with Dr. Larson, Dr. Larson. So. <laughs> That's what, uh, what Peter said was uh, uh, um, the, the, the interspersed habitat that's down there. This is probably the best habitat, deer habitat that we have in the state of Minnesota. And the, the underlying question is why would a deer who lives in the best habitat in the state here pick up and move 20 miles to the best habitat in the state here? Um, so that's one of our research questions, is how are these deer using this, this really, it, it's disjunct landscape, but it's very similar landscape. Um, so we're looking at juvenile movements. We know from the biology of deer that they go through a couple of movements as young animals uh, when they're about 10, 10 months old, almost a year in the spring, and then when they're almost a year and a half old in the fall, those animals move around the landscape and they set up new home ranges. It's likely a genetic uh, characteristic where you're trying to mix up your genes. So you're going from this oak stand to that oak stand, but you might not be related to the deer in that oak stand. So they, since deer have been on the planet for millions of years, we'd have to ask them why they do it, but it's, it certainly works. Um, so we're, then we're looking at some adult male movements, because we know that adult males, even though they set up a home range, they do a lot of trips during the breeding season especially. So we wanted to look at how are these animals moving on the landscape and what's the potential contact among individuals and therefore spreading, potentially spreading disease. So the desire is then to spread, you know, create some, some disease pathway models to tell us that where, where are we at risk for new, new detections based on the landscape. Um, and then also looking at general causes of mortality. We have other projects going on 
where we're looking at ways to improve our deer population model. So any data that we can collect that helps inform that overall population model, we're always looking to do. So the study has a secondary objective of looking at mortality, although that's not, um, not the most important piece. So, so we're actively on the ground looking at how these deer are using the landscape and what they're doing. And lo and behold, so we get Kelsey's in the audience. Kelsey Lashar is uh, uh, one of the folks leading this project. And she's the keeper of all deer pictures. We get lots and lots of trail camera pictures of deer from this project. And what's, what's really interesting, how many landowners do we talk to? We talk to? Okay, so most of this work is on private lands. So we have to get permission to capture deer on private lands. And we establish relationships with those folks uh, through newsletters, through communications, by getting permission. And as a result, we get pictures back all the time. Hey, hey, what number is this? Where was this one caught? Um, and hopefully we don't say, I don't know, the collar's dead. Um, but uh, um, so we get pictures all the time of our radio collar deer. Uh, um, and, it, and it's really neat, and then we can use them. But what we're, so what we're finding in this, in this study, just kind of in brief, is that these females are moving long distances as well, which isn't, it's not that common, but we're seeing female dispersals. Um, those spring movements tend to be longer than the fall movements, so they're setting up new spring home ranges at a further away. Um, and like I talked about with uh, adult males, lots of those movements in the fall are, are like this, where they're going, and, and deer biology being what it is, when males will go try and breed multiple females over the course of a very short breeding season, so they travel long distances, uh, and then they set up their home range again once the, once the breeding season is over. But one thing this study did do pretty much automatically with the first year's worth of data is it helped inform our zone boundary in the southeast. And the, why I say that, that's where the, that's the intersection of, of the, the biological research with the policy end. Um, we know that uh, we used to draw boundaries that were 10 miles around positives. And we were talking about going to 15 and this study kind of showed us that we needed to go to 15. Um, and so this, the boundary that you see in the southeast today is a reflection of a 15 mile circle around positives, not a 10. And that's partially informed by just a year or two of this study. So we're actively using our data to make, make uh, regulatory decisions. So the take home, I don't know how, how long I've gone, so I apologize. Um, the take home, I, I think we can't do anything without legal authorities. We, we, you need to have the, the basis in law in order to change rules and regulations. And that, to me, there's almost nothing more important than that. Um, we hear a lot about, well, just wait for, you know, wait for you know, something better to come along. You, know, you don't need to kill all these deer or something better will come along. You know, we feel strongly that you, you use the tools you have, and that might be postseason culling, that might be special hunts, until something better comes along. It's not, given, given the chronic nature of this disease, where once it becomes established, there's really not a ton you can do about it with respect to eliminating it. Um, you don't have the, the luxury of time to wait. It's not like bovine tuberculosis or even epizootic hemorrhagic disease that's been in the news recently. Those are, the, the EHD is a very acute disease. It doesn't affect populations generally over the long term. And this is the opposite. So, you know, you use the tools you have until something better comes along. And then waiting is just, a, it's just, I, I, I'm often accused of being very direct. I am. It's a bad idea. Waiting is a bad idea. You know, you don't have a spot on your arm and say, yeah, I'll check her out in about six years. Let's see what it does. You know, you go, you go to the doctor. So we look at that, that preventative medicine piece and then trying to react as quickly as we can. Um, the biological research that we do and others should do, it needs to approximate those local conditions. And in other words, we're a big state and a deer in Houston County in the southeast does not behave the same as a deer in Itasca County in the northern part of the state. Why? Migratory behavior, much more snow in the, north, in the northern part of the state, deer are more inclined to, to yard up. So they move long distances for, for winter yards. They don't do that in Houston County. <clears throat> uh, deer in Itasca County aren't challenged by wolves or bears. Um, they are, I mean, they are challenged up north. They aren't down in the southeast. So, 
the biology of deer, even though they're the exact same species, and if I took a deer from Itasca County and plopped it in Houston County, it would do just fine, but they exhibit different biology depending on where they are. So the, the research that we do really needs to approximate those local conditions. You can't just say, it worked here, it's the same there. It's not. Um, <clears throat> You know, I've, I've spent most of my career talking about this. It was kind of the title of my dissertation. Anything you do has, must have biological and social considerations. We just don't, we never make purely biological decisions. I, I joke around with my students that, you know, no, no decision was ever made in the commissioner's office using a p-value. We don't do that. Um, so it has to have biological and social components. Otherwise, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, the funding piece, Public funding and public support. And Roxy talked about that in the broad perspective about values. You know, funding and how we respond to things is linked, is, 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 is rooted in how we value species. Um, over the last, since 2002, we, we've spent about $8.4 million in C, on, on CWD response, and almost all of that has been hunting and fishing license sales. Now, that changes a little bit this year, um, but almost 90%. Almost the other concern, and we're not addressing it here, um, um, is the, the potential human health impacts, or I'm not addressing it. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's risk perception, that people have a, a, a perception that there may be human health implications to this disease down the road. Um, and we have actually documented a loss of hunters. Uh, we're losing hunters anyway, uh, they're aging out, um, but in our CWD zone in the southeast, it's actually about twice as high as the rest of the state. So you can reasonably infer that we are losing hunters because of the perceptions of risk related to disease. And we'll continue to track that. Um, and I think finally, um, as Roxy talked about and what Peter's talked about, the impetus of Peter's work, you know, better and faster diagnostics. We get our presumptive results in three to five business days, um, but it's narrowly constrained to the areas that we're doing surveillance. Um, uh, is, there a, is there a development of a better and faster diagnostic tool going to help the agency? Uh, if, certainly if it's cost effective, but if a hunter can get the results within a couple of days or, or, an, or a day, it helps us report back out. Um, you know, so they're you know, rapid tests. So then finally, environmental sampling. Is there going to be a quick and easy method to, to broadly sample landscapes for disease? That won't tell you what prevalence is, it won't generally tell you what just what uh, the distribution of disease might be, but it would, would certainly tell you if this is an area of concern or not. So, and bottom line, um, I, this is not an embellished slide. I pulled this right off of Wisconsin's website. Um, we're trying to avoid this. You know, this is Wisconsin's known area of infection. Um, what they're seeing is <coughs> massive increases in prevalence uh, exponential increases in prevalence over time uh, as a result of taking a passive approach right around here. Um, uh, so we're trying to avoid that, that big increases in prevalence and that disease getting spiraling out of control. And then also as important, <clears throat> there's a study in, in southwestern Wisconsin where they're looking at deer survival of, of, of deer that have not been detected for disease and, and deer that are positive. And, and in, in two years of research, they're already showing conclusively that deer that are infected with the disease have a much lower survival rate than deer that are not. So go back to my first slide, or one of my first slides. Um, deer that are asymptomatic for the disease actually have higher mortality rates than deer that don't have the disease. And that makes sense, there's something going on in their head. Um, so we're trying to avoid avoid this, you know, increases in prevalence, increases in distribution, decreases in survival. And this is something you would see, you know, in 20 years, 25 years, 30 years for us, because we're 30 years into this really with Wisconsin. So with that, that's all I had.